Good day, beautiful people. This is Natalie Silva with Life Treasures and Golden Moments, where I share with you true stories and miracles and inspiration. How are you all doing today? It's always good to be with you and sharing the stories and everything. And before I get started today, I'd like to uh, shout out there to my listeners and ask if there's anyone out there that has a story of a miracle or a story of an inspiration that they'd like to share with us, please contact me at angelswhisper11 at gmail.com. Love to hear from you. Today's story is a story about kindness. And it's called The Witness, written by Judge Fred M. Mester. I had wanted a law career ever since I was a boy growing up in Royal Oak, Michigan. My father, a tool and die maker, came from Springfield, Illinois, Abraham Lincoln's hometown. And from Dad, I drew a love of our 16th president, this nation's most celebrated lawyer. I admired Lincoln's ideals his moral tenacity, his respect for the truth, and his underlying compassion for people trying to live together peacefully under a complex system of laws. Fourteen years ago, when I became a judge on the Sixth Circuit Court in Oakland County, Michigan, I made sure to bring my portrait of Lincoln from my law offices. Not too long ago, though, my faith in the judicial system wavered. It took a young man named Kenneth, who witnessed an indomitable crime to bring my beliefs back. It is not easy seeing the misery and inequity that pass through a courtroom. The Sixth Circuit covers both the affluent northern suburbs of Detroit and the blue-collar city of Pontiac. Neither area is free of the monsters of drug and crime. A divorce case in my court is as likely to involve a successful professional couple as it is a couple on welfare. Income is no barrier to crime and tragedy. And in so many cases, both civil and criminal, rich and poor children are the real victims. It can get to you after a while. Well, late in 1989, I heard two horrendous murder cases. They were virtually back-to-back. In the first, the Tar case, Two middle-class kids, Joe and Chris, kidnapped Mrs. Tarr, a hard-working wife and mother, stole her car, and forced her to withdraw funds from a cash machine. They drove her to a deserted location and executed her in cold blood. The two boys went back and abducted Mr. Tarr, assuring him that they would be free and his wife would be free if he cooperated. He, too, was forced to withdraw funds. Ultimately, Mr. Tarr met the same fate as his wife on the same lonely dead-end road. But what really got to me was that these boys drove the Tarr's automobiles to teenage hangouts, attending group activities such as roller skating party, barely concealing their crime, and no one contacted the police. No one had wanted to get involved. The other case involved a young woman who wanted nothing more than to get her car washed on her way to work early one morning. The 21-year-old manager of the car wash assaulted her, beat and raped her, then locked her in the trunk of her car and parked in the driveway of his girlfriend's house. There the car sat for five days, while neighbors and others did nothing about the muffled cries coming from the vehicle. Pitiful cries that grew weaker and weaker till they faded altogether. There is nothing more serious than a murder trial, and a judge learns to tune out everything but the law. The criminal behavior in these two cases was shocking enough, but the apathy of people who had been in a position to do something really threw me. I had never seen anything like it in my years on the bench. How could people stand by and do nothing? I asked Lynn, my wife, one night near the end of the second trial. Don't they care about their fellow human beings? On a deeper level and more troubling level, I wondered how God could stand by and do nothing. The woman at the car wash was a recovering alcoholic, building a new life for herself and for her children. The two boys in the Tahar case were good students and athletes, raised in Christian homes. How had evil so completely seeped in their lives? 
Were we becoming powerless as people to combat it? Then I met Kenneth Briggs. I saw Kenneth for the first time when he took the stand in my courtroom as a witness for the prosecution in a notoriety's crack house rape trial. Kenneth was a 14-year-old orphan at the time, living hand-to-mouth on Pontiac's tough east side. His father had died when he was two years old, and his mother, who worked two jobs and still managed to get Kenneth to church every Sunday, died when he was 12. Kenneth was shunted from relative to relative into less and less healthy environments. That is how he came to witness the brutal assault and gang rape of a 13-year-old runaway. Testifying in court that day, Kenneth pointed his finger at the leader of the assault, who was sitting with his lawyer at the defense table. The defendant was a big man, six feet five and 220 pounds. Anger smoldered behind his hard eyes. Are you sure this is the man, the prosecutor asked, his voice cutting through the shock silence in the crowded courtroom. Kenneth nodded. He had identified his 19-year-old brother, Michael. There is more to the story. Unlike so many witnesses, I see Kenneth had not plea bargained his way out of a prison term in exchange for testifying. He had come only by default to live with Michael in the crack house. The first night Kenneth walked through the door, without so much as a toothbrush to his name, he witnessed something horrible, a 13-year-old girl being savagely abused by six young men, the youngest four years older than Kenneth. The six urged Kenneth to join in on the rape, to become a man, they said. Kenneth refused. The assault went on for hours, and it petrified Kenneth. She was covered with blood, Kenneth said. Somehow, the girl's eyes focused on Kenneth. Please help me, she whispered. Kenneth did. When Michael threatened to shoot people and ran upstairs to get a gun, the other men followed him. Kenneth freed the girl, put her in the car, and sent her to the police station. He then ran as fast as he could to a friend's house, more scared than he had ever been in his life. He had violated a code off the street, and he knew he would have to pay. Eventually, his friend's mother helped Kenneth go to the police. That's when they arrested Michael. When Kenneth finished testifying and the jury was deliberating, I turned to the detective in charge of the case, Eleanor Mickens, and and expressed my astonishment, formed in part by the cynicism that had crept up upon me. What made him go through with this, I asked. He's just a good kid, Judge, Eleanor replied. Here was a young man who might have thought he had all the reason in the world to turn his back on society, to conform to the law of the streets. Yet something made him draw a moral line, get involved, and do the right thing. I had seen so little of it recently in my courtroom. I had no doubt it was in a great part of his religious training that guided him, that saved him. I understood fully how much Kenneth had risked taking the stand. They'll they'll eat him alive out there, I told Detective Mickens. She nodded. Already, people had turned away from Kenneth, Eleanor explained. A great aunt had ordered him not to testify. No one wanted a snitch living with them. It's time to get involved, I thought, suddenly and a bit angrily. I had been so disheartened by seeing people reject their responsibilities to society, people who were more interested in protecting family members than their fellow citizens, people who refused to trust the police or testify truthfully in court. But what about me? I had to do something for Kenneth. Word of Kenneth's courageous testimony quietly spread through the courthouse and beyond. Secretaries, clerks, cops, even defense attorneys offered help. I talked to my church, the First Presbyterian of Royal Oak, and they took up an offering. The cousin of a friend was able to find a family in Ontario, Canada, 
Kenneth could live with, and a good high school for him to attend. Many people pitched in, and we were all able to get him away from the streets of Pontiac. Seven years have passed. Kenneth now attends Oakland University, not far from the courthouse, and we stay in touch. He is a psychology and biology major and wants to counsel inner-city youngsters like those in Pontiac. He has grown from a good kid to a good man. A year ago, the Detroit Lions football team heard about him and passed the hat around the locker room to help with his tuition. Now he has a part-time job with a team as an assistant equipment manager. Kenneth's brother Michael is serving life in prison. After a difficult struggle, the victim is making a life for herself. I once asked Kenneth, What made him come forward? He shrugged and gave me a look that said he really didn't have much choice in the matter. I know Kenneth loved his mother very much. I think that he did what he knew she would have wanted, however painful the consequences. I still see tragedy and sorrow in my courtroom. Yet I now believe the vast majority of people in this society want to be kind and do right, just as Kenneth did that day on the stand. God, I know, does not stand by utterly. On the contrary, what Kenneth showed me is how God has given us all the tools we need to serve him. For if there were ever anyone for whom doing the right thing carried a heavy cost, it was that young man Each of us, including judges, needs to stand up and be involved in our neighborhoods, at work, and through our churches and synagogues. We must help those whose obstacles in life are greater than ours. It has been said that the only thing needed for evil to triumph is for good people to do nothing. Kenneth saw evil and did something. My old friend Lincoln said it well. Let us have faith that right makes right, and in that faith, let us to the end dare to do our duty as we understand it. This is Natalie Silva with Life Treasures and Golden Moments. Until next time, take care, God bless, and have a beautiful week.